43, I had a question coming out of chapter 8, and I had a few folks ask about certain questions in the first chunk of questions, so I'm just going to do all of them together. I'm going to, this video will be for numbers 49 through 61, and here we were told that we took a look at a sample of 39 flags. All right, so our sample size was 39, and just to give you an idea, this is 39 national flags. As of me, Filming this screencast, there are actually 195 countries out in the world. So this particular data set is looking at 39 of these nations. And we were just counting the number of colors in each national flag. And you can see right here in my list, I, I wrote the chart or the table that they gave us, the frequency table. So what that's saying is there was one country that had one color, right? There were seven countries that had two colors. There were 18 countries that had three colors. And just since we live in this country, that's where the USA would be, right? We have red, white, and blue. Seven countries had four, and six countries had five, at least in our sample. So there could be more... Uh, there could be flags out there with more than five colors, but at least based on our 39 flags, our 39 countries, um, this was our, our sample space, one through five, and here was our frequency. Okay, so now let's start getting into the problem. So the first one says, what's the sample mean? Well, I have this discrete numerical variable, so I've got my sample space in L1, my variable, excuse me, my frequency in L2. I'm going to run one bar stats L1, L2, and here are the um, calculator output screen. So you can see my mean, right? you can see the standard deviation, and I'm just going to remind us here that we don't use this, this bad boy, that one we do not use, and there's my sample size. So that gets us through number 49, right? Now keep keep note here that I, oops, excuse me, I, I labeled this, right? So this is 3.256, that's a numerical average, so it's got to have some units in it, and it was that the average flag has about 3.2 colors in it. Admittedly, a flag can't have 0.2 colors, right? You either have three or four, but this is still the numerical average. There's a standard deviation. There's a sample size. So what is X bar, right? So if, if our variable is the number of colors in a flag, then X bar is going to be the average number of colors in the flag, in a national flag, in our sample of 39, right? of 39. So this is the, the number of, or you can see it right here, the average number of colors uh, in these national flags from our sample. And then it says, what is your, what is X bar estimating? Well, it's always estimating the population mean, right? So X bar is a point estimate for mu. Mu is the actual average for all 195 countries, right? So what I mean by this is we know X bar is 3.256, but I don't know what mu is. The only way to find mu is if I actually went through and I sampled all 195 countries, then I could find mu, but I didn't do that, or at least the book didn't do that. So we're gonna try and make our best guess for mu. So based on the sample, right, if the sample mean is about 3.256, I bet mu is close to that, right? I don't think it's up at like 18 or something like that. All right, so stats will always be our estimates for these parameters, and it asks in number 52, do you know sigma, all right? So this was for 52, do you know sigma, which is the population standard deviation? And where it sometimes gets confusing is you might think you know it because it's over here on your calculator. But this is part of why I just don't ever look at this line. I wish Texas Instruments wouldn't do that, um, but they do, okay. Um, so do I know the population standard deviation? No, because again, I did not talk to 100 all, excuse me, I did not talk to all 195 countries. So I don't know the population standard deviation. I only know S. All right, so 53 says, which distribution are you going to be using? Well, we're in mean land. We're going to use the T distribution. And you always want to specify what your degrees of freedom are. Because while we only ever have one standard normal curve, meaning the Zs, I actually have an infinite number of Ts. Right? So there's, well, that's not how you would draw it. <laughs> there's an infinite number, uh, this is some of the worst drawing of T distributions ever, but there's an infinite number of those graphs, and it's solely based on degrees of freedom. That'll tell you how high your peak is and how high your tails are. So since my sample size was 39, that tells me I have 38 degrees of freedom. So we're going to be on the T sub 38 distribution. That's what that notation is. I'm on the T distribution and I've got 38 degrees of freedom. And then it starts asking us about area and the tail. So this is what they're talking about in 54 and 55. 
So let's pretend this was T sub 38. All right, every T distribution, it looks a lot like the Z's. Zero is under the peak. Now, if I'm gonna go make a 95% confidence interval, because that was the directions I was given, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna capture the middle 95% of this T distribution. All right, so if I was gonna shade this area here, the area under this curve is gonna be about 95%. All right, so then 54 says how much area is in both tails. So when you hear that term tails, they're talking about the stuff that you didn't shade in your confidence interval. And we know that the area under any distribution needs to total out to 100%. All right, so then the area, if you're combining both tails, would be 5% because this is the middle 95%, so 5% has to be on, an outside, on the outsides. And then heading into 55, it says how much in each tail. Well, through symmetry, this has to be 2.5%, and this has to be 2.5%. And you might be saying, what are you doing with this alpha shenanigans? That's, that's going to play itself out in Chapter 9. We'll talk about our alpha level. It's always this complement to your confidence interval level, or I should say your confidence level. All right, so we've got that. The next thing they're actually gonna have us go do is crunch some numbers. They're gonna say, hey, let's go ahead and get that confidence interval. And I'll scroll in a bit, but this is my formula, right? If I'm in mean land, it's gonna be x bar plus or minus some t star times s over square root n. And I'm gonna just plug in the values that I had before, right? We talked up top, and I, I can scroll up, but we talked about x bar, we talked about s, and we talked about n, right? We had them right here, so I'm gonna go use those numbers. All right, so let me scroll down so we can see a more clear look at this. All right, but here you see me putting in, oops, let me erase that. Here you see me putting in my X bar, here's my S, and here's my N. Okay, now how do you get T star? That's a, a good thing to talk about and a good thing to know. So in order to get any critical value, you need your confidence level. And if it's on, uh, if it, you're in mean land, which you are, you need degrees of freedom. And we knew those to be 38. We also knew our confidence level was 95%. So I go to this column and I look for 38 degrees of freedom. And you can see that I don't have it exactly, right? 38 is trapped in between 30 and 40. And how we play this out is since 38 is in here, we have already breezed past 30 degrees of freedom. We've earned that. But we're not quite to 40 degrees of freedom. We actually would need more um, nations in our sample. So we have not achieved this level of precision yet. So what we do is we play it safe. So yes, technically there isn't a row for 38 degrees of freedom. So we go conservative and we go with 30 degrees of freedom. Now, if you wanted the exact value and you have the TI-84, you can use inverse T and you have to put the percentile and the degrees of freedom. And you might be asking me, well, if you're saying we're doing a 95% confidence interval, why did you put 97.5 over here? Well, I said percentile. So let me show you why I'm putting 0.975. If we have 95% here and we have 2.5% per side, and I need this percentile, right? This is my T star value. I need to add up the area to the left of that. So I need to add 95 and 2.5 and that's where I'm getting 97.5. All right, so then I can crunch this on my calculator, and you can actually also just use your, um, your you can directly use your T interval um, function inside your calculator, and that's where you hit stat, tests, and you'll have to give me a moment just to click on my calculator. I'm not remembering, I wanna say eight, yeah, stat test eight. All right, and then you can enter that information. So I'm gonna head over here and I'm gonna say, hey, there was my lower bound, my upper bound, and then there's my error bound. So let's talk about how on earth I found that error bound so we can talk about how I got 0 0.330. But again, I just wanna reiterate, we've got units hanging here. All right, so when you hear error bound, all right, sometimes folks refer to it as the EBM, sometimes ME. You'll see me a lot of times write margin of error. So EBM is error bound model. MOE is margin of error, and then sometimes they just abbreviate with ME, but it's everything after the plus or minus, so it's this part of the calculation, and when you crunch that number, it's 0 
you also could have gotten 0 0.330 a couple of different ways. If you take 3.587, if you take your upper bound and you subtract that mean of 3.256, actually, let me do all of this on the x-bar axis. If I take the difference between these two numbers, it's going to be 0 0.330. I could also take my mean and my lower bound and subtract them. If I subtract those two numbers, it's going to be 0 0.330. So that's my error bound model. All right. 57 says, hey, get the confidence interval, right? And, 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 or excuse me, it asked me, what is the actual CI? So I go through and I, I, I check my assumptions, right? I had a random sample. My sample size was large enough for the central limit theorem to kick in. We knew the sample standard deviation. And here you see me actually running stat tests eight, right? I've got my variable in L1, my frequencies in L2, 95% confidence, go down and hit calculate. There's my lower bound and my upper bound. And like always, if you think of it again, we have the X bar axis. I drew it up top, but if we go 2.93, and I'll just abbreviate here, 3.59, the number that is always in the middle is your mean. So 3.26 has to be here in the middle. Right? And then we add a margin of error to get to the upper bound of our confidence interval, and we subtract a margin of error, I made the sound effect, to get to the lower bound of our confidence interval. All right. All right, so moving on to 58, it actually officially asked for the graph. So let's, let's really look at this graph. So I want to point out, you see that there's an X bar here on the X axis because we're graphing averages, right? We are on the sampling distribution for X bar. So sampling distribution oops let me write the word four all right and that's why you see the x bar here note that i have the word average labeled on my x-axis and then i have my variable right you see that my sample mean is under the peak i added a margin of error to get to my upper bound I subtracted a margin of error to get to my lower bound. If this is the middle 95% of my data, then this tail has to be 2.5%, and this tail has to be 2.5% because of symmetry, and we can write all of those as decimals. All right, and then last but not least, let's interpret it, right? We are 95% confident that mu, the true average number of colors in national flags, is somewhere between 2.926 and 3.587 colors. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.